Uh, it is September 1st, 2015. We are in Vancouver, and uh, the interviewer, as usual, will be William McCray. So we're just going to start with a few uh, simple questions. So could you please state your full name? My full name is your full name. Clarence Mark Rebliati. Rebliati. Yes. Apologies. <laughs> and your age? I'm 72. And uh, where exactly were you born? In Lytton, British Columbia, and that's at the confluence of the Thompson and Fraser Rivers. It's a small, it's a village, eh? Yes, pretty. Populations approximately 500 people. Okay. And uh, as a child, what did your parents do? Well, my mother was a homemaker in the traditional sense of the era. Uh, my father worked in the family general store, and he ran the uh, the butcher shop side of it. But the business, they sold hardware, uh, clothing, groceries, uh, you know, everything it takes to supply it to a small town. Yeah, yeah. And then mm -hmm. uh, the family business was sold. He opened his own butcher shop. But then to add to that, he bought a cattle ranch. So he was able to supply a fair number of uh, cattle that he needed to supply. And he did that all through the, through the war, the uh, Second World War. And he got tired of that, and then he sold the ranch and sold the business, and then bought uh, some construction equipment uh, for highway building, but not ran that for, I don't know, 15 or 20 years. So there was a downturn in the economy, but he had an opportunity to join one of the large construction firms based in Vancouver, who had contracts to produce specialty concrete aggregate for the uh, Columbia River and Peace River dam systems. And then that kept him going for I don't know, another 15 years until he retired. Okay. And uh, you as a child, what did you, uh, what were your pastimes or interests? Well, I was active. Uh, didn't read much, <laughs> but I did, uh, well, as a, as, a, as a younger child, I rode, rode my bike, delivered papers, uh, went fishing down in the Thompson River and some of the other Stein, Kaik, uh, near Lytton, uh, trout, steelhead spring salmon, uh, and you could actually fish them in those days. Um, yeah, I did that. I had uh, two horses, so we were, even as a, I guess about a 14-year-old, we went 35 miles, so it's at 50 Ks, back in the coast range, stayed uh, about 10 days or so, uh, thought nothing of it, uh, did that. Uh, and then, you know, and as I got older and had a driver's license, yeah. 16, then we did a lot of hunting, but we, we didn't trophy hunt. We, we hunted to fill the freezer, and it, it was fresh air and exercise. And okay. I climbed every mountain you can see from Lytton. Nice. Activities so, like that. So already uh, an explorer as a well as outdoor a fresh air, <laughs> yeah. Um, a few adrenaline rushes. Yeah. And uh, did you at one point did you develop an interest for science or in school? Was that uh, something you excelled at or? Well, <laughs> to be honest about school, I didn't excel in anything. Okay. Uh, uh, it's something you did. Uh, it, it wasn't a priority in my life. It should have been, but it wasn't. No, I just liked the uh, the outdoors, and I had a you know small town, so you know everybody and know that everybody knows you. There were a couple of kind of prospector type fellows that did it uh, part time. They were always looking for someone just to come along, okay. so they ran out alone. And uh, yeah, it seemed like a good idea. We drive up the Fraser and up in the mountains and prospect. I didn't really have any idea what I was doing other than maybe carrying his lunch and a, <laughs> a jacket, but it was out. And then uh, for fun, in February, March, when the Fraser was really low, we'd go down and pan for gold just to see whether we could find any or not. To Ever find anything? Well, it, yeah, it, it lit in the gold is very, very fine. Like the heavier nuggets of the long dropped out. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it's super fine. You'd uh, lick your finger, oh yeah, and then touch it, and then you get a little sparkle. Of it, you know? Okay, but you could, flakes. It, it was nothing getting like fifty or hundred flakes, but it still added up to no weight. Yeah, it was so fine. But, but anyway, it's something to do, and you freeze your fingers. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so after uh, after primary school, high school, where where uh, what did you decide to do? Well, once I graduated uh, from high school in Lytton. I think my mother had everything packed up and we left Lytton about the next day. 
moved to Vancouver, and then oh, it, was all, it, it all worked out timed with your high school uh, graduation. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, there he, my my father wasn't working in Lytton anymore. He was working okay, all over the already. province, so it didn't really matter where mm -hmm. we lived. And my mother had been from Vancouver in her, her early days, had just more opportunities and uh, more cultural activities, shall I say? Yeah. <laughs> Other than you know, one movie a week at the Legion Theater. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so I came down here, and then uh, my brother, who took geological engineering at UBC, saw that I was at loose ends and suggested I uh, might enjoy attending the British Columbia and Yukon Chamber Mines Prospecting Night School course. So that started in the fall of '63, and then I don't know, went to the end of March or whatever, '64. So I figured out, by then I knew everything I was to know about prospecting <laughs> and uh, knocked on the doors of every mining company in Vancouver for about two months. Finally got hired and then in May of 64 off I went into the bush and the rest is history. How long was your class? Oh, it was, uh, I don't know, two hours once a week for, for four months or something four months. like that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it was. Huh. It was it was probably 50% social and 50% actually learning things. <laughs> but there was uh, Dr. Harry Warren, was very well known in the industry, uh, was one of the uh, lecturers, and then Dr. Dirt Templeman Cluett, who was a grad student at UBC at the time, but I knew him because he was a classmate of my brother's. And they were both very enthusiastic sp speakers and very personable, and that increase my level of interest in mineral exploration. Yeah, you know, it was outdoors. I, you yeah. know, you got paid to go hiking, which so you, you know, you Something just you do it like fun. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you see all the wild animals and all that. It's, it's just neat. For sure. Um, and uh, at that time was, because, I mean, the mining industry can often be quite cyclical. Um, when, when you were knocking on doors, um, was it a hard period? Were they no, no, hiring it's, a lot? It's, uh, it, no, they, everybody was just waiting for the snow to melt. Okay. You know, it was you know, March, April, and nobody left town until May. Okay. So that, that's what that was. So when I was out in the bush in the summer of 64, one of the other, one of my co-workers had applied to the Hellebrae School of Mines, which was, they renamed it to the Provincial Institute of Mining. Uh, and he had applied and was rejected. Well, didn't have the prerequisite courses from high school. And he threw the, the calendar in the garbage box. I had read every novel in camp at that point, so I pulled the calendar out, read it, and said, hey, that's not bad. It's a two-year course. You do one year, and you only have one year left. Uh, so I sent my <laughs> $20 away or whatever and applied and was accepted. Uh, and then so I did the two years at Halebury and graduated there in 60, the spring of '66. And while I was there, a recruiter came around from Michigan Tech or Michigan Technological University. Uh, they had a mining department at Michigan Tech that was short of students and they were on the verge of, if their enrollment dropped any more, the yeah. university thing was shutting the mining department down. So uh, I got in. But while I was in my first, they were on the quarter system there, so in the first quarter, one of the courses I had to take was a mineralogy course over in the geology department. Anyway, I found the geology department far more stimulating than the mining department, you know, designing uh, pillars in an underground coal mine uh, versus looking for mineral deposits uh, you know, up for the daylight. Yeah. Up in the daylight. So as each quarter progressed, I had signed up for one less mining course and one more uh, <laughs> geology course. Okay. So anyway, then I graduated in 69 with a bachelor's degree in geological engineering. And what uh, would you consider your first job uh, in that field? Well, the first summer I was in the bush, I, you know, line cutter, soil sampler, uh, kind of the camp grunt, <laughs> whatever, whatever had to be done, I did it. Yeah. It, was, it was a learning curve, but then I was always working with people with more experience. And so I had a summer's four months experience before I even went to Halebury. Then I worked every summer all the way uh, through until I finished uh, university. Uh, first job in graduating from Michigan Tech was with, uh, well, it was Geophysical Engineering and Surveys Limited, but that was a tech corp. 
uh, company, company, and I was based in uh, Bathurst, New Brunswick. Oh, so I was. I'm from, I'm from Camelton. Camelton, oh yeah, right yeah. next door. <laughs> so I was there for about a uh, year and a half, and then they they closed that office. They offered me the, an opportunity to go to. Uh, I think they had an office in Shibugamu, but you know I was from British Columbia and Shibugamu seemed like the wrong direction. <laughs> So you wanted to get back here eventually? Well, I wasn't particularly interested in going to Shibugamu. I, yeah. didn't, I didn't speak <laughs> French. <laughs> and, uh, well, I just, just came back. Uh, got a job with uh, Silver Standard. That's kind of the old Silver Standard where they, they just shut down the Silver Standard mine up at Hazleton, where they mined silver. And they were running uh, a number of exploration programs in the Yukon and BC, and I joined uh, Jim McCausland there in their Stikine Arch uh, program. In, in the summer of 71 that led to the, uh, the we put in the Discovery Trench of the Red Crisp deposit, though at the time you know, gold was still $35 an ounce. So we actually didn't assay for gold, we assayed for copper and silver and molybdenum. And, but we had uh, couple hundred meters of about 0.28 percent copper. We realized we had a broad zone. We laid out uh, a drilling, a proposed drilling program. Uh, as Sarco was the joint venture partner with Silver Standard, uh, they put up most of the money and Silver Standard ran the program. But as Sarco decided uh, it didn't meet their criteria or their minimum criteria, so the project uh, at that point didn't go ahead. Anyway, subsequently, other people picked it up, and now Imperial Metals is uh, operating a 35,000 ton a day mine, and they've taken, well, they have a, about a 2 billion ton resource there now. So, so I played a, a small role uh, very early on. Could you, so, could you uh, just go through kind of your, the big steps in your career? Sure. And then we'll well, that, we'll then go back. Silver Standard, I joined. New Connex Canadian Exploration Limited, which was the Canadians controlled uh, subsidiary of Consolidated Goldfields, London, England, originally founded by Cecil Rhodes. I was with them for seven years and in 1977, working with Dr. Peter Fox, I put in the first, let's say the discovery drill hole on the QR deposit, which uh, went into production, it's mined out now, small deposit. Uh, not, don't remember the resource, three, three or four hundred thousand ounces, but it was open pit, about three grams per ton. And then I, um, they consolidated their Canadian and U.S. operations into one company that was, well, Goldfields did. Uh, I was offered the opportunity to join their U.S. group, which I declined. Uh, then I worked for the Saskatchewan Mining Development Corporation in the Exploration Division, Northern Saskatchewan. Spent a couple of years looking for uranium. Mm -hmm. uh, had an opportunity with uh, working with Anaconda in Vancouver, so I came back to Vancouver. I enjoyed Saskatoon very much. Yeah. Great, great place. Great weather. But it, it was <laughs> cold in the winter, but it was bright and sunny. Yeah, less rainy. So uh, less rain, more, more sunshine hours. Seriously. So back here. <laughs> Uh, then I was with Anaconda for a year. Um, S Saskatchewan Mining Development Corporation opened an office, or were contemplating opening an, an office in Vancouver, and they invited me to rejoin them. I uh, didn't have much interest, but they kept upping the offer. <laughs> so then, when it was up to about 50% higher than I was then <laughs> currently making, I I relented. Um, <laughs> that was great for about a year and a half. And then the Saskatchewan NDP uh, lost the election, and then the new government uh, shut down everything outside of Saskatchewan. But when I was in Saskatoon, I am sure I was the only uh, employee of the Saskatchewan Mining Development Corporation that had a BC Social Credit uh, Party membership. And I had my membership card pinned over my desk. So it was always, you know, the far right wing versus the somewhat left wing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it was a, a curiosity within the organization. Yeah. Uh, let's see. <laughs> so then we were in an economic downturn. Uh, 
the minus, mining industry had not fared well when the NDP had been in power in British Columbia. And I would say it was going consulting when the SMVC job ended. And I, but I was uncertain, you know, because they got in again, I could see the, the expiration end of the business uh, cratering. Uh, and then I was, I had uh, spoken to Dr. Hugh Square, of it was then Selco, um, trying to market some of SMD's uh, projects that I had acquired for them. And in, in the process, he got back to me and offered me a job with Selco. So then I had a decision, you know, do I stay on my own or do I take a, what looked like a secure job. So I went with, with Hugh, great fellow, great mentor, learned a lot from him. But within one year, uh, in, so that would, would have been in 80, so yeah, joined Selco 83, B, BP, British Petroleum Mineral Division, bought out Selco, so I ended up working for uh, BP. And uh, that was a whole other uh, group of people with a order of magnitude greater bureaucracy. And I think in the Vancouver office, they were more interested in internal politics and finding mines. <laughs> oh, anyway, not, uh, that, that uh, lasted until uh, January of 86, and I was uh, given the opportunity to seek employment elsewhere. <laughs> and all of the projects that I'd been involved in were put on the shelf. So after a month of, you know, like, you know, where should I go from here? I went back to them and uh, offered to option three of my former projects, uh, <clears throat> three, out of, three out of the six that I've been running. Um, but they turned me down and said I, they didn't think I had the financial wherewithal to do anything with them. So no, and I mentioned two of them that, well, you put them on the shelf, you're not financing them, so they're just gonna sit there and mold. Uh, yeah. So anyway, they said no, so that's all right. I went away and thought about it. So a week or two later, I went back and said I would be willing to market them, those projects, to other companies on their behalf at no cost to them. They couldn't understand that, but I went for a finder's fee. Yeah. Well, we signed off on the, and they gave me, <clears throat> they went for it, and they gave me one month. So anyway, signed the paper. I, I, the office was on the eighth floor, press ground, went down the elevator, out the door, an acquaintance of mine walked by, and I said, Lauren, I have a project for you. I talked to him for about 10 minutes on the sidewalk. We went back in, pressed the button to the eighth <laughs> floor, cut the deal. <laughs> so that was, that was easy money. Then I had a, another project. Uh, it was a bit of a long shot, but I was, I was able to link it to a good, good marketing story. And I marketed that one to Lauren X. And that was in the real Tinto fold or real algum fold. Okay. Uh, that one took me about a week to market. But the one I liked the most was the Mount Milligan project. And I went to 23 companies. And it took me to, I, I can't remember now, but it, about the 28th or the 29th day of my one month that I had available before I was able to uh, cut a deal on that one. And then from there, that's history. Uh, uh, the, the group that I marketed to, they ran the project themselves the first year. Uh, they were not particularly successful, and the geologist that they had hired to run their project uh, wrote a very negative report. And anyway, I was invited back as a consultant for three days to review all the data and give an opinion. And I said, well, there had been good work done, and a fair area had been eliminated, but the area that I felt was the most prospective still hadn't been touched. So I read a three-page memo, whatever, and said, but I'd like to run the project. So I was hired on as a consultant. Okay. The first, the second, and the third of my holes all hit, and that was the uh, Mount Milligan discovery. And then, so that was 87, I put those holes in, and then 87, 88, in the fall of 88, November, then the Hunter Dickinson group came in. And we had about 60 holes at that point. And then in uh, 89, we discovered the uh, Southern Star. Everybody just calls it Mount Milligan. Okay. If you put the two pits on them, 
the two pits coalesce, so it basically becomes one pit and it's all rolled in. But they're already two separate deposits, uh, Mount Milligan, Maine, if you like, and then the Southern Star. Okay. And then uh, I ran that, but that was uh, 100 people, 24-7. And as project manager, you're the chief geologist, you're the project manager, you're the marriage counselor, you're the judge, the jury. Uh, pretty challenging. Yeah. <laughs> so I got burned out. So in I don't know, May or whatever of 1990, of course I'd drill out like 720 drill holes by then, and it's really moving more into the engineering field. Okay. And I was tired of being there, you know, another old ATCO trailer night, you know. <laughs> So I stepped aside from that. This was with Hunter Dickinson, or were you still? Well, it was Continental Gold, but Continental Gold was managed okay. by the Hunter Dickinson group. Uh, but but then I knew everybody in the group, and uh, the Hunter Dickinson group. Then there was David Copeland, Ron Thiessen, and Bob Hunter. They ran their own show separate from Hunter Dickinson. Uh, Bob Hunter had his foot in both camps, but then in. 1990, the two groups kind of merged full time. So I had about a month off, and then a friend of mine that I'd worked with at SNDC was a director of a company that was broke. They had some mineral claims up in the Tutagon of north central British Columbia, and said, Mark, the company's got some mineral claims. They're going to expire in a week. They have no money. We'll have to pay cash in lieu of doing work and it's going to be my own personal money, and I want to know if the project is worthwhile. And he said, I want to hire you for a half hour. So I said, Jim, for a half hour, you're, you're only going to get a yes or a no, but no technical rationale, because it's just, you know in the consulting business, you just don't do that. So anyway, hour, yeah. we, 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 we went to the Bombay Cycle Club uh, for lunch, but they used to call them beer parlors and they served <laughs> hamburger and fries. So he went, that was the lunch he was buying me. <laughs> uh, so we went down there, he handed me the report. Yeah, you just, you know, they're going to have all the regional geology, all that stuff. He f I f skipped all that, I went to the back where he had all the assays. Looked at the, they had about a dozen old drill holes. I just looked at the assays, copper gold, copper gold. And I've been through like 700 holes a milligan. Uh -huh. And then anyway, then I just closed. I didn't read any of it. I just looked at the assays. So he he kept waiting for me to say something. You know, the way hamburgers came. And I think we had a coffee after the beer. But he said, "What do you think?" And I said, "Pay cash in lieu." And that that was it. He said, "Thanks." Uh, he phoned me back a couple of days later and said he had. And I said, "Well, you know, if." Uh, ever hear of anybody that's looking for a property of merit, uh, let me know. Uh, you know. Let me know if you're willing to farm the project out. And I knew it'd be desperate to do that because he put up his own money. And so, it, and, the, and then it's important with this property of merit because uh, I was consulting to the superintendent of brokers who managed the Vancouver Juniors for the stock exchange in the government. Okay. And for them to raise funds, they had to have a professional engineer sign off on that the property was of merit rather than just a piece of moose pasture. So I knew this project would qualify in that sense. That was a almost a secret committee. Uh, the industry at large knew the committee was there, but they didn't know who the committee members were because you could take a lot of flack if you said it property wasn't of yeah, yeah. merit and whatnot. So you have to remain anonymous. Yeah, so that was part of it. So uh, I let a month go by and then I phoned my friend Jim back, Jim Kameen back and said, Jim, are you sure that you're looking for somebody to come in? He said, oh yeah, he's desperate. So I went down the hall like you know, about 20 feet to uh, Dave Copeland and Ron Thiessen, said I have another Milligan for you. And I, by this time, I had read through the report. Jim left the report so with you, me. So you knew your yes was a good yes. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So I went through it, and I said, "Hey, you know, these guys don't know what they have. The geology, geology has been misinterpreted." Now I had had the the experience to have looked at the Copper Mountain, 
deposits, the, uh, the Afton deposits. And at Afton, the original Afton, was all super team. And the company that had Comess initially had only drilled into the super team. And they, they used an RC rig, so they were just cuttings. So there's this brick red clay-like material with little flakes of native copper. And it assayed for gold, and they had no idea what it really represented. And I realized it's a lookalike for uh, upper part of Afton. So we went in there, and we, we drilled about 50 consecutive or great holes. And then from there, there was the uh, historic, the historic Comess property was actually six kilometers to the north, and we renamed it Comess North. And the okay. new discovery, which was on Comess Creek, we called it Comess South. And they're six kilometers apart. So after we got Comess South going, and then we expanded our, our mapping up there, and we had a look at it, and said, you know, there were a couple of old holes that Kennecott had put in in the, in the late 60s or early 70s, but they were, uh, it was AX, you know, it's about half inch core, and core recovery is about 12%. Okay. So, hey, you know, they've, they've demonstrated that the copper there, in this environment, there should be gold. So we went in and put in a couple of holes, and we had copper, low grade, copper and gold, but every, every sample top to bottom said, okay, we're into a, a system. <clears throat> it uh, shows great continuity. We have to work on the grades a bit, but you know, we only started in one spot, so, so it's a large alteration zone. Uh, so we worked on that, but probably 90% of our efforts went into commence, commence South, an area immediately around it, and we grabbed enough dollars to drill a few more holes whenever we could, and we had expanded Commence North from nothing up to about 150 million tons. But at that point, it was still open in all directions. Uh, but then um, Ella Colander felt that they could add more value by progressing the engineering at Commence South. So the exploration of Commence North shot down. And then in due course, uh, uh, Royal Oak, Peggy Whitty, came in, took over El Condor, put, out, put the early efforts into getting Commence South going. But as we exited the project, we wrote a report laying out a drill pattern on Comess North. About their, their first 10 holes or so were right on the proposed drill collars, and then they never looked back. And then they bumped the geological resource, or inferred resource, if you like, up to over 600 million tons. And they ran into permitting challenges on getting Comess North going. But anyway, Peggy put uh, Comess South into production, ran into a falling copper and gold market. Northgate came in, refinanced it, ran it, and then that was a very successful mine that ran for I don't know, eight or nine years, produced almost three million ounces of gold and I don't know, several hundred million pounds of copper. That was good. Oh. And then from there, I worked on the Prosperity Project, Casino, uh, Prosperity Project in the Caribou, uh, that's copper gold, the uh, casino property in the Yukon, copper gold and molybdenum. And then uh, Daryl Johnson and Dave Jennings and I went down to look at a massive sulfide project in Mexico, uh, Campo Morado in Guerrero State. And uh, we went and looked at it. And it was very obvious, again, the people that had it didn't really recognize the potential, not necessarily of the historical deposit that was mined uh, just before and, and into the Mexican Revolution and then idle since. They didn't really realize what was there, but we, I'd been through Myra Falls and then I've been to several massive sulfide mines and massive sulfide districts. And I said, hey, we have a district potential here because there are other prospects there. And so, they, Dave Jennings and others in the Hunter Dickinson group then put together a land package. And we went down and basically we didn't look back. We uh, expanded the historical deposit from about 3 million tons to 10 million tons of massive sulfide. Not necessarily all or great, because there were, there also were metallurgical challenges there. It was very, very fine grain. But we went on to discover six more deposits and collectively about 50 million tons of massive sulfide. Um, the metallurgy was, well, the combination of the metallurgy and the grade. You know, the tougher the metallurgy, the higher the costs. 
And so then you need the higher grades to cover the higher costs. But anyway, in due course, it went into production, uh, about 1,500 tons a day. And the G9 deposit uh, was the, the uh, high enough grade to get it all going. But then you know, the current uh, slump in metal prices, uh, it's the mine shut down now, it's uneconomic. And also the social scene in Dwarro has uh, deteriorated with the cartels, drug cartels moving in. and It was a wee bit sketchy when we went in initially, okay. um, but we got on very well. We had a John Arthur, or Johnny Arturo, as the locals called him, had spent uh, 20 years in Bolivia, fluent in, in uh, Spanish, was just a little guy, very gregarious, and he went and talked to everybody. That, you know, they lived in these little mud huts, and what, uh, adobe huts. Uh, all over, he talked to them all, and so before we build a road anywhere, uh, we'd go and talk to them, and he could he could tell they weren't too pleased about a road going to a certain place. And I said, well, it would be okay if we built the road on the other side, because they all, obviously they had a marijuana plantation over there. <laughs> they didn't want a road going by, so they say, well, can you wait? We're ready to harvest. Wait till we finish okay. harvesting. <laughs> so we just had to get along with them. You know, it's, yeah, well, it wasn't our issue, and these people were only making a few thousand dollars a year. You know, they. They got paid next to nothing, and they, they grew pole beans on the corn, and then they had squash or pumpkins growing underneath, and that was their only income. And at, at one point, we had about uh, almost 100 of them working, uh, line cutting, soil sampling, helping with the surveyors, or you know, we had a lot of ladies working in the camp, uh, assisting the cooks and looking, uh, housekeeping, you know, those types of chores. So we brought a lot of employment there, so we're very, very pleased. And then, of course, Hunter Dickinson Group was always looking for the next uh, project, and then they went from one company to three companies to five companies. So there were more companies to feed with new projects. But a lot of time, now looking at projects, uh, Alaska, BC, the lower 48, and then through Central America and all over South America. And But one project that kept popping up on the radar screen was Cominco. Well, it was Cominco then, but then initially, the Tech Cominco. And that was a project they called Pebble Beach because uh, it was kind of tundra, rolling hills, just like a golf course. Okay. That's Pebble Beach in California. Uh, we looked at it. I, I was first became aware of it in 1990, and it was kind of always one of interest. And whenever we had a, uh, a meeting discuss, you know, where, what should we look at next, where should we go, it would come up. A couple of approaches were made to Tech, the or, well Tech Cominco at that time. Um, they weren't interested. Then around I don't know, 2001, 2002, they said, "Well, we will entertain an offer." And see, we had the Hunter Dickinson Group had picked up the Prosperity Project from Cominco, and they had done quite well in that. And so, anyway, uh, Bob Dickinson, Ron Deason uh, negotiated an agreement with Pebble, and in I think 72, we did a uh, small program, geochemistry, geophysics, a few drill holes, and then in 73, we started drilling in earnest, and we basically didn't look back. Uh, with Pebble, about 60%, see, Kamenko had done about 100 drill holes at that point, but about 60% of those holes bottomed in about 0.3 copper equivalent. You take the value of the copper or the gold in the molybdenum, convert it to dollars, and then convert it back into copper. Okay. So that's copper equivalent. It's a little more <laughs> complicated than that, that yeah. but that's the overview. So that 60% of the holes bottom in 0.3 or better, but 30% of the holes bottom in 0.6 copper equivalent or better. And what's the cutoff? Like what's the... Uh, well, you know, it depends good? on the copper prices, but you'd want about 0.2 copper copper okay. or better. And so at Pebble, if you had 0.2 copper, you'd probably be in the 0.3 copper equivalent range. Okay. And so Cominco had had roughed out a for a non-43-101 compliant inferred resource of approximately a billion tons. Well, by the end of 2004, we had increased that to 4 billion tons. Okay, at that point, in, in December of 2003, 
uh, in 2003, I went and looked at a couple, a couple of porphyry prospects in China, and I heard about one in Tibet. So in December of 2003, I went to Tibet, Tibet and looked at it. But I was doing pebble, so it was just a quick trip over and back. And I recommended the Hunter Dixon's and acquire the Tibetan uh, porphyry. Well, it was it was epithermal. It was an epithermal prospect with a copper occurrence on the other side of the mountain. Anyway, I said, it's a great big alteration zone, which looks interesting, we should try and cut a deal on it. So it was back to, uh, back to Pebble, then we, that was for the December of three, so in, this, in 2004, we saw that Pebble was absolutely wide open, and that the uh, intensity of the alteration was increasing going to the east, the quartz stock work was becoming more uh, intense going to the east. The grades of all three metals were increasing to the east. <clears throat> so I recommended we drill. The mining engineer said, we have four billion tons, you know, that's enough for 40 years, we don't need any more. And then I was over in China getting that project, or over in Tibet, getting that project going. And at a board meeting, they made a decision that they wouldn't drill outside of the proposed pit. Uh, I'm thinking, like, well, it, it's getting better and better going to the east. So anyway, the directive came down to no drill holes beyond the outside edge of the pit. So I puzzled over that for a week or two. So anyway, I had a drill uh, <laughs> come free, and we'll just say this is the outside of the pit. Yeah. I stepped back about 15 meters, drilled a hole 60 degrees outwards, but I <laughs> had the drill inside the pit when I had about... Uh, Oh, I don't know. 400 meters of looked like good ore grade mineralization. I had a second drill come free, so I moved it over 400 meters and did the same thing. And so when the second hole was about halfway down, the, the first drill rig was finished its hole, and then I had a third rig come up, did the same thing again. Then I told Bob Dickinson what I'd done. But by then I knew we had it in the bag. I read about that. Yeah, we had a, <laughs> whatever it was, you know, 800 plus 830 meters of 1.48% copper, over 800 meters. Way better. So it was like, you know, like over a half a mile. <laughs> wow. And, and what was the real reason they didn't want to expand? Oh, they, they had 40 had years, they had 40 yeah, years so they resource. Just, yeah. uh, but I said, well, how do you know where to put your plant? You may put the plant on top of the rest of the deposit. And yeah, it turned true. out, so we added 6 billion tons. Wow, and so that'll be good. For, and above. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> and about 4 billion tons was about twice the grade of the earliest 4 billion tons. And so what is there's, what are 107 million ounces of contained gold, uh, I don't know, 80, 85 billion pounds of copper, and I don't know, 6 or 7 billion pounds of moly, and lots of silver. Wow. Oh, anyway, did that, okay, so I was doing that, but at the same time I had the project going in Tibet, and we did mapping and sampling in 2004 to figure out what's going on. Started drilling in 2005, in 2005, 2006, and 2007. In each year we added two million ounces of gold and a billion pounds of copper. So in three years we had six million ounces of gold and three billion pounds of copper. And then the group exited. Uh, Tibet and China at that point sold out to a Chinese company. Okay. So, how many companies does uh, Hunter Dickinson manage now? They have about ten. Some are more active than others. Biggest than they've ever been, or? Yes. And are you uh, still? Do you still work full time, or? No, or retired. Uh, or? This year I'm on call. Uh, okay. I'm a living archive. <laughs> yeah, mark what happened in '97. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Such and such a place. Uh, last year I worked about two days a week, averaged over the year. I had weeks that I yeah, yeah. happily did nothing, and then I'd work a week or ten days straight. To, as as it came up the year before, I worked three days a week, but before that I worked uh, full time. Okay. You know, this would be my. 51st year in the industry, so it's, you know, time to slow down. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But it's a recurring theme uh, in these interviews is uh, everybody seems to, yeah, slow down, but never 
Well, it's never an, exit the it's game. It's an addiction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's exciting. You're in the front end. Yeah. You know, you, you go places no one's ever been before. You find things that haven't been found. Mm -hmm, true. Uh, there's mentoring along the way. You know, we're not going to be doing it forever. What, where's the? Where would you say is your favorite uh, favorite place you travel to if, uh, for work? Or most memorable. Well, place. They, they, do you like the place, or did you have the most success? Uh, uh, both, or real the tougher it is, the, the tougher it was, the more stories you have to tell. <laughs> you know, if it's just something on the side of the road, up in the Caribou, well, it's just a normal day, right? Yeah. Uh, well, the toughest was the Solomon Islands, uh, 100 degrees Fahrenheit or whatever it is, 38 degrees yeah, Celsius, 100% yeah. humidity. Uh, Malaria laden mosquitoes, and the other mosquitoes carried dengue fever. <laughs> I did a traverse, and you know, your body just reeks in that weather. And we're in a camp, and it was a lousy camp, and it, it was someone else's project, and I was doing a bit of consulting on it. And anyway, went up, it was going to be the last day, so I wanted to do a traverse up on a ridge, and it's all jungle and everything, so I go all the way up and over, and I come down, and we'd come in on a, it wasn't quite a dugout canoe, it was made out of boards, but the same shape. We come in off an inlet and then up a mangrove swamp to the mouth of a river. So I told the local guys that's where I was going to end up, you know, at, at noon. So I come down and I'm right at the mouth and it's really hot and yucky. So I uh, got my, my little pack and my clipboard and everything and hold it over my head and away to right across. Uh, put it on the far bank. Oh, that water felt pretty good. And you're so sweaty, you're soaking wet. So yeah, I just yeah. stood there. So I'm right where the small river, big creek, whatever you want to call it. It's right where it went in the mangrove swamp. So I'm there and I'm up to here in the water. <laughs> and then uh, 15 minutes later, one of the local guys comes along and he jumps up and down. And he's yelling at me in whatever the local language is. But I could, I didn't know the words, but I knew what he was telling me. It was like, bad. Like, get out of the water. <laughs> so get out of the water. We load the stuff in the, in the canoe. We go about 100 meters around the corner and a uh, saltwater crocodile slides yeah. off the bank. <laughs> And fortunately, I was just standing there, so I wasn't splashing. If I, was, if I had been swimming, I'm sure I would have just disappeared off the face of the earth. Wow. But anyway, there it goes. So well, that was a, it wasn't a fun job, but you know, there you go. Good, fun story. Good story to tell. Yeah. Um, Tibet was pretty exciting, but it was a very challenging place to work. Uh, the locals had minimal education, maybe grade two, grade four. They'd never really been anywhere. And in a year, we hadn't been able to explain to them adequately well to sort out the difference between North America, South America, and the country called America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then you go there and you have a community re meeting and you try to explain to them why you're there and what you're going to be doing. And they had no comprehension of even what mining was. So that was a real challenge. Uh, and then you had uh, to do anything, you had to deal with the Chinese bureaucracy because they ran the government. But you're working in the Tibetan community. Yeah, which is already tricky. And so then the, the Tibetans would see that you're working with the Chinese, and the Tibetans aren't so keen on the Chinese uh, administering Tibet. Chinese were perceived to be looking down on the Tibetans, and we were in the middle. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, we're okay. everything went fine, but you were never fully comfortable that they were going to continue to go fine. But anyway, we had lots of success and no no incidents, and we worked out a uh, kind of a community wide compensation package for any disturbance of the land because yeah, they raised their cows and yaks and donkeys and goats and sheep up in the sheep up in the hillsides where we're building drill sites and whatnot. So but anyway, we worked something out that based on the number of square meters disturbed and so they could buy alternate feed until we had a chance to replant and you know those sorts of things. So it went okay. well. That was a very exciting project, but again we drilled dozens of holes one after the other uh, in ore grade, in good grade. Uh, that was probably so we had about two hundred million tons of about point Six grams of gold, uh, 0.47 uh, percent copper, and around four grams of silver. Strip ratio around one to one, starting right at surface. So that was uh, that was pretty exciting. Nothing would beat Pebble, but in 2005 and 2006, 
I had uh, 12 to 14 drills pulling ore grade holes in Tibet, and then I had six rigs pulling long, good grade intersections of pebble, all going on simultaneously. So uh, hard to beat those yeah. those two years. Hmm. And then the next year was okay too, but you know after, after you rough something out, then you know it's just infill drilling, and then that's work. Yeah. Um, are there, um, and we can go back with this question, but are there any dysfunctional uh, jobs or uh, projects that you worked on? Yeah, SMDC, uh, the exploration division was the uh, exploration manager, nice guy, but he came out of McGill, had been a professor, was totally academic and not practical at all. And that was always a challenge. So that was the probably the toughest one. Yeah. From that perspective. Are there do you have any examples of, of how the the academic uh, well one of them was work so uh, well with the they wanted practical. to sample groundwater to identify water that had say higher than average uranium content. And most water is virtually none. Mm -hmm. So even low concentrations would be anomalous. And then they thought, well, if you go to a groundwater emergent area, like a spring, okay, that would work well. And they came up with the idea, well, rivers would be better because they'd be collecting the water from all the springs. But the, the Fond du Lac River had a fair current. And you thought, well, just go out in the wintertime on the ice. Well, lake ice and river ice are quite different. And the, river, uh, the lake ice can be solid and two meters thick. The river ice is uh, like flaky pastry or it can be, especially where the currents. So it's like all ice and air bubbles. <laughs> and you could just drop through it. Yeah. So I know you could put a crew out in that and it's you know minus 30. And if you go through the ice and the current washes, oh, you're, like, you're, you're yeah. gone. And then working with water when it's 20, 30, 40 below. And it went to minus 50 Celsius for well, it had five days. <laughs> yeah. So that's... Uh, wasn't practical, and yeah. that this kind of that was the, you know, the extreme of the concepts. Yeah, yeah. it would have been okay if you know we we're just sitting in the office discussing it, but to try and implement it, it wasn't mm. going to work. Uh, did you join any uh, organizations throughout your career? Yes. Well, in when was it? 1971, 1972. Uh, I was elig eligible to join, and I did join the. Uh, uh, Professional Engineers Association of British Columbia. I had been a CI member in when I was in Halebury in the 60s. That membership may have, but I didn't continue it, but I was busy away, whatever. But I've been a member for now, I don't know, 20 more years or whatever, whatever, whatever the records say. Uh, I remember the Society of Economic uh, Geologists. Uh, had been a member of the SME, that's a U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, organization. The British Columbia and Yukon Chamber of Mines, which is AMBC now. Um, yeah, that would be it for professional organizations. I'm a member of the Technical Advisory Committee for Geoscience British Columbia. So I'm the Vancouver MEG group, Mineral Exploration Group. Uh, it's informal. You go once your lifetime member. There's no dues, but okay. organize uh, a speaker uh, once a month for about seven months a year. Uh, it's if it's a highly technical presentation, that's fine. But if Joe Prospector finds a brand new occurrence that's exciting, well then that person may give a, a presentation of how he found it, okay. and then the audience is not meant to ask tough questions. You know, you respect this. Maybe the only time this person's ever given a presentation in their lives, so you get the full, the full cross section there. So I was involved in that as an executive for about four years. So I worked from my way up, mm -hmm. the bottom to the top of that. Did that. Uh, I'm on the uh, <laughs> review committee for for APEG, so Professional Engineers and Geosciences. Uh, so if there's a, an applicant applies. And it's turned down. They can appeal, okay. and I'm a member of the the uh, appeal committee. So that must be interesting. Yeah, it is. Yeah, because yeah, you have people, local people, for whatever reason, maybe they didn't present themselves well. 
uh, or perhaps their application was, say, partly incomplete or not concise enough uh, to people from other parts of the world that uh, could have 10 or 30 years experience that are, for whatever reason, in, in British Columbia now. So you get to meet them all, yeah. talk to them. Now, uh, just moving a bit more in the social um, social questions, I guess. Um, in terms of women, how, how absent or present were women in the workplace? And well, I mean, in, in my workplace. Yeah, and I mean, you've worked in many until, different places as well. Okay, from 64 to about 77, there were none. Okay. Um, when I went to university, in mining engineering, physical metallurgy, geology and geological engineering, there was one girl enrolled. Okay, so I give you the yeah. balance there or the imbalance there. But in the late, mid to late 70s, uh, women <coughs> started enrolling in the, uh, en enrolling in the geological and say uh, mining engineering, metallurgical sciences. And then they started being in the camps. They were, instead of hiring a Second World War veterans who had been cooks in the war, they were all getting older and retiring. And then the company started hiring, uh, say, students in dietetics and nutrition, um, or their ladies getting their first aid certificates and cooking, because they're in the camp so that they can be first aid attendant and cook at the same time. So that changed the dynamics, but it also impacted and work was done because you could, you know, a twin otter would come in with eight barrels of fuel. You could grab two geologists, send them down to the lakeshore and, you know, unload the fuel. But you couldn't grab two lady geologists and send them down. They just physically didn't have the strength. Mm -hmm. So that changed the dynamics in the camp. Then we had to hire other people then to do the heavy work and you couldn't really hire any more geologists because if you need four, you only need four, but then we had to hire people to run the gap. So it changed that. And then, of course, um, there was a degree of socialization that then occurred. And mm -hmm. so very often you would have, say, the boss's daughter or a daughter that was an acquaintance uh, to the boss or one of the directors. Uh, come in, so they might be, say high school kids, 17, 18, maybe first year of university, maybe the first time away. Uh, then you got a camp of guys, and then you had the others that were 25 and 30 and whatnot. So when they're 25 and 30, they can kind of look after themselves. But the younger ones, well, then you know, you're not their parents, you have some responsibility. Where's the line? What's your you know, what do you need to know? What should you know? What should you act on? Uh, and there's no, there's no lines. I mean, there's really no guidance either. Yeah. And then what's your business and what isn't? You know, they're in a company camp. So if anything happens to them, if they're injured or whatever, well, that's company business. But what they do on a social scene, perhaps is none of your business. And right, so that, created a bit of stress for me or others that managed the camps at that point. Uh, but now, uh, many of the projects are about 50-50, and that's ironed out. And, and let's say... 50-50, uh, uh, Well, pretty close. I oh. mean, it, it shifts, but 30-60 uh, or 40-60, yeah. like, but they're always, they're always there. <clears throat> so, but we're not getting the younger kids anymore. Oh, okay. it's, uh, <clears throat> it's just not an interesting. No, it's interesting uh, for them or for you guys. No, the industry's say. changed. Okay, it's uh, more hardcore now. You have to be able to contribute. We're not at a family employment agency, which it was more like that. Okay, you, know, you hire my son, I'll hire yours. Well, that that really isn't happening anymore. I'm not going to say zero, but yeah, it's yeah. less inclined to be. Okay. Um, now you, you but, but it softened the camps. <laughs> it softened the camps. Yeah, they're, it's uh, <clears throat> they're less rough.
Yeah. There's less swearing. There's no, <laughs> there's no Playboy pictures on the walls anymore. You know, that, that's, yes. that's gone to zero. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's a little more civilized. Yeah. Or a whole lot Which more. would encourage the yeah. more participation from women. Yeah. And then. If there's less Playboys on the walls. And then. <laughs> in the olden days, whatever that was, um, when somebody, the boss came into camp, you know, we always used to bring a bottle of scotch. Virtually all the camps are dry now. Mm hmm. End of story. They're dry. Uh, Was that ever an issue when you were managing? Uh, the further north you were, and the more of the northern people there were, yes, it became issues. Mm -hmm. And then to actually, yeah, people who aren't sober. Well, while on the job. yeah, and they, you know, they smuggle in a forty pounder, and they drink the whole thing in one night, and there you go. Fist fights and tents were coming down, and uh, then you got to clean up in the morning, and then they're t they're too sick to work, <laughs> <laughs> and you know you, they made enemies, <laughs> and you have to you have to get the job done, and you got to iron all that out. Yeah, you know, huh. you know I had when I did Melligan, I had a driller's helper make a derogatory comment to my first aid attendant about his sexual or perceived sexual orientation. The first aid attendant took exception to what the driller's helper said. And this was, they kind of lingered on in the evenings in the, in the, uh, in, in the uh, dining hall. The first aid attendant grabs a steak knife and goes at the driller's helper who was like twice as big and five times stronger. And he, takes the knife away and puts it up to this guy's throat and then just threw the knife away and told the guy to get out. I'd been in Vancouver, the flight was delayed getting back to Prince George. It's a four hour drive to get to camp. I, there was a blizzard. It's four o'clock or two o'clock in the morning I arrive and here's the first aid attendant who was on day shift walking around with a chainsaw that was running. Now it surprised me he even got the chainsaw started but anyway. I said, so I, I pull up in front of the, the cookhouse where the parking space was. And I said, what on earth are you doing at two in the morning? Walk around and say, well, that griller, you know, well, well, I'm going to get him. There's my first aid tenant, intending to go after the driller's helper with a chainsaw. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To then do like first the first aid, aid attendant, yeah. right? <laughs> so anyway, I said, well, go back to your bunk and go to bed. Oh, I'm afraid. I said, well, like, sleep under the kitchen table that I you know, stood in the morning. <laughs> he won't come in the kitchen looking for you. Say so the next morning, of course, I got to fire the guy. But now I have no first aid attendant. So then you have to get on the phone and hire, you know, any first yeah. aid attendant from the closest town, get him in, drive the guy out, talk to the drill foreman, fire the driller's helper. Now you, now you lose a shift. So you fired both people. Well, oh, you had to. Yeah. You know, you can't, you know, zero tolerance for that stuff, but you still got to run the project. Yeah. So now you lose a shift or two on the drill and productivity drops, your overhead still continues on. And then, you, then you know, God, you fire the wrong guy sometimes because nobody would really fess up and they knew something was going on. <laughs> so you'd settle for yeah. two out of three. <laughs> code of silence. And then, yeah, the code of silence. And then one person perhaps was or wasn't involved, but then he's got a few buddies on the crew. So when you fire him, then their buddies quit. Mm. <sighs> Drama. Stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> the bigger the crew, you know, the yeah. goes on. So, um, but it kept life interesting. Um, now, as for you had, you had talked a bit about it uh, in especially your projects away from Canada, but if we look at Canada specifically, do you think there is a um, disconnect between the mining industry and the, I guess, the general population? Population, in Canada? Yeah, absolutely. And, and how can you explain that. When do you, how do you see that? Well, most people in Vancouver have no knowledge, or, or mi rephrase that, minimal knowledge of British Columbia beyond hope. And hope is at the head of the Fraser Valley. It's 90, what is it? 90 miles, so whatever it is, 150 kilometers up the Fraser. Well, it's the beginning of the Fraser Canyon. And then they know the Okanagan Wine District, and they don't know anything about the rest of it, perhaps never been to Prince George or maybe only went through once 25 years ago. 
They all have cell phones. They all fly to Hawaii or Mexico for vacations. No idea where metal comes from. You don't have metal, you're, you're a caveman. No connect whatsoever. They only hear or say that bad things. Mm -hmm. They have no idea the amount of employment the mining and mineral exploration industry creates in Vancouver. All the lawyers doing the agreements, uh, all the consultants uh, working here, all of the, all the uh, environmental assays or environmental analyses in addition to the regular exploration analyses. That's a, most of that's based in Vancouver. No knowledge of that whatsoever. Mm. Um, it's exported, any products exported. It generates foreign currency to offset the money they spend flying on their vacations to other parts of the world. Uh, so it's a challenge. And it's, it's uh, vastly underappreciated. Yeah. Um, now in terms of, um, I guess you're, you've had a lot of experience and worked I mean, in many, many different places. So uh, in, in your opinion, uh, are there specific uh, events, disasters, advancements, people uh, that, that need to be mentioned when talking about uh, you know, the recent history of the natural resources in Canada? Well, for myself, Hugh Square was probably, Dr. Hugh Square at Selco BP, was probably the, the person who I gained the most from, uh, from a mentoring sense. Uh, then you, you connect uh, Bob Dickinson and uh, Ron Thiessen, uh, and in the earlier days, uh, Bob Hunter, in their capacity to raise funds. I went to Campo Morado and Rod says, how much money do you need? And I said, 10 million. He says, okay, start work. Uh, Pebble, it was the same question. And I said, I'll need all you can raise. <laughs> <laughs> so we spent 100, Pebble, we spent in the order of $150 million uh, in drilling alone. Um, well, Dr. Harry Warren has probably began the uh, the application of chemistry to the geochemical aspect of mineral exploration. Uh, when I first ran into him in the fall of 63, he was talking about the copper content in rainbow trout livers in the Babine Lake. And that lake stood out amongst other lakes for the copper content. And of course, there was uh, bell copper and uh, whatever the other one just down the lake was. The porphyry copper deposits and just through natural processes some of the copper was uh, getting into the, the waterways fish. and the fish then ate the critters and, and then the copper was concentrating in the livers. Not to a toxic extent but up levels high enough to build a T-Tech with the uh, instrumentation that was available in the day. Um, Dr. Harry Warren uh, received the gold medal from the British Medical Association for his pioneering work and where he'd studied the lead content of lettuce relative to the distance from the uh, Trans-Canada Highway. Oh, yeah. And so the lettuce growing on the side of the road had a lot of lead because all the gasoline was leaded. Yeah, yeah. And then further away there was less and less lead. And that was one of the first environmental linkages between uh, the uptake of metal in plants that was and that's what was recognized and he got his gold medal for that and then since then uh, well gee, you get paid to go fishing <laughs> that was good so I've, I've used uh, geochemistry very extensive by uh, water sampling uh, soil sampling uh, till and then now with the new techniques uh, mass spec ICP you know we used to analyze for three or four elements. Now we think nothing of analyzing for 50 or 55 elements. And so some only occur in trace amounts, but you had higher trace amounts, and now you can pick up anomalies distant from a deposit through the use of geochemistry. Of course, geophysics has improved uh, vastly. You have uh, Behringer and Harry Siegel and those people that pioneered the geophys geophysical and uh, geochemical end of the the industry. Drilling is vastly improved. Well, we probably have probably four or five times the productivity now. 
since when? From well, since I since you started the ministry, yeah. say since uh, sixty four. Okay, um, and we'll uh, we'll finish just on a few last questions. Um, in life, what uh, I guess we can split it in half, make it a bit easier because it's often a tough question. What are you proudest of? And we could say in in life in general, and also professionally. It's it's hard to separate. Or, or both, yeah. Try to separate those out. Well, <laughs> the same. Industry-wise, I've been involved in the discovery of a number, and whatever the number is, eight or nine, mineral deposits. And about half of those either have been developed and gone into production or in the, or in the process of permitting and moving towards production. And they've created uh, hundreds of years of person years of employment mm -hmm. makes you feel good yeah you know I'm one guy passing through but when uh, 600 miners have jobs for 25 years and they're supporting the families and, and whatnot uh, that's feel good yeah. on a uh, personal note I didn't think I'd even get to university let alone come out and have a what others perceive as a successful career and I feel it was one too sounds like um, <laughs> family uh, Two children, a son and a daughter. Um, my brother, yeah, my brother was the first of the family to get a university degree. And my grandparents came to Lytton in the mid 1880s. Um, my dad had about grade six education. My mother had grade eleven. My brother was the first of the Rebliati family to, get, to have a degree. Um, my daughter graduated from university. My son um, got into snowboarding as um, freestyle initially. Half pipes were about one meter high. Now they're about, <laughs> yeah, huge. about 10 meters high now. Uh, but he also, he'd done ski racing as a Grouse Mountain Thai Ski Club up in Grouse. Uh, he's usually in the top 10 if there are 100 kids racing and very often on the, on the podium. <laughs> but they, t they race mostly as teams. So the team would come first, not the individual racers. Mm -hmm. But we always kept track of everybody's times. <laughs> uh, so, but anyway, he they had a new coach, and as he moved up to the higher levels of skiing, they got a new coach. Uh, they didn't get along. So he sold off all the high-end ski equipment that I just bought. <laughs> bought a bought a snowboard, <laughs> uh, and then you know it was, that was in high school, and then he went to school and. Went snowboarding and then uh, he signed up for one of the uh, colleges in Vancouver and then they had a strike and then they, the principal said that uh, well this strike's not settled by Friday we'll refund uh, tuition fees. I think he was first in line to get his refund. We had a place at Whistler, he went straight to Whistler. He worked there, uh, ski shops whatnot. Um, and then, then he was snowboarding 100% of the rest of the time. Yeah. Uh, then he, uh, well, he, he won on many of the local races, or was competitive in the, the local races. Started, he uh, we went, I raced against uh, Craig Kelly, the godfather of snowboarding, and beat him at the uh, Mount Baker Bank Slalom. And he won the uh, U.S., the, the overall championship for the U.S. Amateur uh, Snowboard Championships. Uh, <laughs> until they found out he was a Canadian, <laughs> they, they, they took the cup <laughs> oh, yeah. and all the loot away from him. But anyway, he won it. <clears throat> and then the the same spring, he won the Canadian Amateur Championships uh, out of Calgary, someplace. And then uh, he wanted to go on the, and, and in winning the U.S. and the uh, Canadian Amateur Championships, he obtained a buy. And he's able to go on the World Cup circuit without having to do the North American uh, Pro Circuit. So he went over to Europe, and of course, before he went, he said, "You know, Dad, you know, like <laughs> I don't have a sponsor." Yeah. <laughs> so Dad sponsored him, but on the proviso that uh, his goal was to be the best in the world. You know, there's there's no point going for something in the middle. So in his first race, there were just over a hundred uh, competitors. He came about 87th, and that was in a GS 
which from my perspective was good because he thought he was good winning the amateur championships. So I told him where he really was. Yeah. And he did whatever number of races, 10 or 15 races before Christmas. And he wanted to come home. I said, no way I'm paying the airfare. <laughs> you're going to get back. You're going to be jet lagged. You know, you go find a place. Anyway, he bucked in with some new acquaintance of his <laughs> in Switzerland. <clears throat> then he continued on. But by the end of the first year, he'd worked in the second seed. Okay, the first seed is the top 15. Might be the top 16, but whatever is it. Okay, and the second seed is the next. Well, when you're in the top seed, you go down first. So only if you're 15th, there's only 15. The ruts are only created by 15 people. You're in the second seed, the most is 30 people. But if you start 80th, you know you need a periscope to see that through the ruts. So he yeah, worked yeah, himself yeah. into the second seed, and in his in his second season over there. Uh, Fairly early on, he got a second place. So he got on the podium in uh, in uh, Bormio, Italy. Then with a couple more races, he worked in the first seed. And then he was in the World Cup uh, series eight years before the Olympics. And in those eight years, he had one year where he was second overall. And that's Solemn, GS, and Super G. And then in the shoulder years of that year, he was third overall. So pretty good. His Main event that he's best at was the uh, Super Giant Slalom, which would be the snowboarder's equivalent to a downhill. Yeah. Uh, one year there were only three of those races, and he had a, a first, second, and a third of those three, so he podiumed in all three. But when the Olympics came on, uh, it was only going to be GS. Like, he was not a freestyler, so those are two separate disciplines. Um, he qualified for the GS, and then you know, the rest is history. Yeah, he won gold. Now he's back to skiing. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I was I was when you said he switched his, out of skiing, I was a bit sad because I'm a I'm a skier. Too well, he still snowboards, life. but yeah, he's you know, going to skiing now. So, well, you know, he snowboarded for twenty years, and then he was on snow about two hundred days a year. Yeah, and training the other all three sixty five more yeah. or less. So you have enough of that. You're living on a duffel bag. You know, the Europeans can go home for the weekend. Anybody from North America, you're away. The Austrians, they were supplied with cars, um, uh, physiotherapists, they have a massage, yeah. they had a tenant. The, the sponsors the edges, are pretty good. Man. You know, all this. <laughs> Canadian guys are up at night, you know, uh, filing the gouges out of their board and fixing them up and waxing themselves and you know, yeah. three guys to a room and... You know, your your uh, your sports psychologist was your roommate, <laughs> sleeping overnight in railway stations. Yeah, yeah. You know, different world. You, know, you yeah. get tired of that after a while. For sure. So. Um, last question, real quick. Um, if you were to speak to someone much younger, like a student, for example, what's the one uh, piece of advice or life lesson you could give them? Okay, if you're going to go into geology and mineral exploration, you have to have a master's degree and you need an entrepreneurial bent, and you have to work on that side. It's a cyclical industry, and when there's lots of jobs, students enroll, and by the time they graduate, we're at the bottom of a trough, and there's no jobs. You have to be fleet of foot, uh, flexible, and you got to take whatever work you can generate. Mm -hmm. The other one is go seize every opportunity to go on every mine tour you possibly can. And the best rock to look at is drill core that starts outside the deposit, enters the alteration zone, goes through the deposit, comes out the other side, because that's what you're more likely to encounter when you're doing your exploration, because you rarely ever find ore grade mineralization sticking out of the ground at surface. Okay, and be learn to be able to assess what has the best potential to evolve into a, a viable deposit. If you have an outcrop that's 30 meters square, or 30 meters and square meters, and there's barren rock all the way around it, you're not going to find the 200 or the 500 million tons you need to be viable. And you have to. And that applies to all of the deposit types. And you have to learn that. Uh, early on, I had the good fortune to realize that, 
and when I was a truly independent consultant, whereas Hunter Dickinson, for most of the years, I was an in-house consultant. So in-house versus out-of-house. Uh, I turned down a lot of jobs, where after reviewing whatever reports they had, I felt that it had virtually no chance of success. Because in having coffee with people, going to conventions, the geologists that everybody knew were the geologists who had been associated with discoveries. And people, good people, but had worked 10 or 30 years that had never been on a major project, only the neighbors knew who they were. Mm. And so it was a gamble to turn down work when you didn't have work, but then you wanted to be associated with, with success. Yeah. Now, I had a lot of projects that you know, didn't work out, but the other thing is, you got to know when to throw in the towel. You got to go to your client and say, it isn't working, you need to find a new project. You know, any money you any additional money you spend, you're just throwing good money after bad. They don't like it, and you just hope you get paid for your last invoice. Yeah. <laughs> but you got to do it. Yeah. You know, you owe it to them to tell them yeah. straight up. For sure. And then the minute you realize you're working for somebody that's uh, less than fully forthright, you have to resign. Because you, if you stick on and there's a fuss, it'll stick to you, even though you had no one no involvement in it at all. And again, that means you're on the street without a job, but you have to do it. Well, thank you. Okay. Anything you'd like to add? That's enough, unless you got the rest of the day. Right. Yeah, no good. <laughs>